All right, hello everybody. Hello. All right, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the April edition of the Drupal NYC meetup. Um, we're actually going to uh, put the meetup on hold and go to the red carpet premiere of Game of Thrones downstairs. Yes. No, no, we're not gonna do that. Who's, who's pushing buttons over there? Why, what are we doing? We're refreshing the page. All right. Um, doo -doo -doo. Come on, JD. All right, well, while he does that, here we are, housekeeping. Um, a couple quick, oh, first of all, I am Alex Ross. Um, uh, yay, hi, I will be your MC this evening. Um, a few housekeeping items, please mute your devices so they're not jingling and dingling during the, uh, during the, the, the various talks that we have tonight. Um, please use mics to ask questions. We have a couple mics and we'll be walking around the room. Um, if you need one, just wave, shout, send up smoke signals, do whatever you need to do to get that. Um, in addition, we have, uh, we have restrooms in this, in this building, which is fantastic. Uh, men's room is down that hallway, two-thirds of the way down on your left. Women's room is down that hallway, two-thirds uh, two of the way down on your right. And there are also gender-neutral restrooms in various locations on this side. Um, uh, yeah, that's it. And we have internet access. It's like, it's very annoying because you have to sign up like you're in a cheap hotel. Um, but it's on the bottom of every slide, so um, feel free to use that. Um, ooh, that was a good one. I got Holing laughing over there. She's trying to hold it in, but she can't do it. Yeah, okay. Um, most of my jokes don't land, by the way, just so you know. Uh, so prepare yourself. Okay, um, uh, connect with us. Yeah, we have a Twitter account, twitter.com slash DrupalNYC. Uh, we have a, uh, a Slack uh, team. Please join our Slack team. Um, you can uh, sign up at drupal.nyc slash Slack. Um, and there's a channel dedicated just to this meetup, so please go to the channel dedicated to this meetup. Um, you can, uh, you know, you can connect with all your, your friend, your new friends that you're making while you're here today. Um, agenda, so announcements, we're doing that now. We have some presentations tonight. We'll talk more that, about that in a minute. Um, a couple quick closing remarks, and then um, unlike, unlike meetups past, we are not meeting at Bill's Bar afterwards. We are meeting at Johnny Utah's, which is uh, also on 51st Street. It's on the other side of the street, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, they have a mechanical bull. That's apropos of nothing. I just wanted to let you all know they have a mechanical bull at Johnny Utah's. Um, so uh, make sure you uh, take pictures. Okay, here we go. Today's talks. Um, all right, so we're gonna have a couple lightning talks about little known modules. Um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna ask the audience. I think is the is is the plan. And then we have a couple of people who we have a couple of plants. Hopefully, maybe sort of eh, we'll get there. Um, but if you if you happen to have a module, and we'll we'll try and like uh, you know make this a little bit exciting. If you have a particular module that you've been using lately that's particularly useful, particularly exciting, um, uh, or or they're cheering for me. They love me. They really love me. Um, then uh, uh, please take two minutes. Tell us what that module is. What you've been using it for. What was your use case? How did it help you solve it? What was the, you know, what was the uh, experience like using it? It was great. It was terrible. It was horrible. Um, so we'll we'll get into that a little bit when we get to lightning talks. Um, and then uh, Adriana, right over here, is going to be talking about uh, following the building brick road, building flexible and complex layouts using nested elements. Um, so yeah, so we look forward to that talk in, in a little bit. Moving right along. Uh, organizers, um, somebody put Monty Bot back in the slide. Oh, this makes me nostalgic. Um, so all the people in this slide are, are your organizers. Many of them are here tonight. Um, we like to put this up so you know who is organizing the event. And you can come up and you can tell us, hey, I've got some great idea. I've got, uh, I, I have a suggestion to make. Um, I have a question. The people in those pictures, so organizers, raise your hand. We got one over here, JD, Holing, uh, Chris in the back, Yergi, right? Yeah, okay, so come, talk to us, give us feedback, ask us questions, we'd like to hear from everybody. Um, oh, status of uh, Drupal NYC Incorporated. We are incorporated at this point. Um, the paperwork has gone through. Um, we we are waiting for like tax exempt status and things like that, but we're, we're, we're we have a, uh, a, a incorporated nonprofit at this point. Um, so yay, woo! Um, it, it, you know, for those of you who have kind of been following the saga, you kind of know what this is all about. For those of you who haven't, just a real quick uh, recap. Um, you know, for a long time we've had this organization and people have been kind of like, I'll put 50 bucks in my checking account, kind of like 
uh, uh, ways of, of, of getting things paid for and getting things um, dealt with on an organizational level. And it's, it's been very haphazard and it puts a little bit too much of an onus on one person or another. And we realize that we've, we've matured to the point where we really need to make this an official thing so that we can, you know, um, we can have events and we can do uh, camps, which we do in, in New York um, uh, with some frequency. We could have uh, uh, this, you know, this event. Um, Etc. So it's been a long road to get us there, but now we have that incorporation, and uh, and that's great. So if anybody would like to know more about it or like to get uh, get involved in Drupal NYC, the nonprofit, you can come talk to me. You can talk to, really talk to any of the organizers, and we'll put you um, in touch with the various members of the board um, of the uh, of the nonprofit. So it's cool. Uh, venue food and drink sponsored by your good friends here at NBC Universal. Um, yay! Um, give me just two, two seconds. Okay. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, so thank you, NBC. All right, next one. Um, our after party sponsor is now needed. Uh, we no longer have an after party sponsor, so if you have um, a company or somebody you want us to, uh, um, you want to help sponsor our after party. Uh, it's a great way to get your, your logo up here. And I shout your name, and everybody says, yay, every time at all these meetups. So all the different Drupal developers and all the people interested in Drupal throughout New York will come here every month after month after month, hear about your company, and they know that you guys are, are, are supporting us. So please um, you know, talk to the um, organizers. Uh, you can get in touch with your Slack if you're interested in sponsoring the after party. Um, then you needed for May meetup. Big important thing, we do not have this space in May. Normally we have this space every month. We do not have it in May. Share that with your friends and your neighbors and your neighbors' friends and their neighbors, all right? Um, so no matter what, the, the meetup will not be here in May. Um, and then, um, and uh, we're still looking for a new space, so stay tuned to our Twitter account, stay tuned on Slack to find out where, where it is going to be as we figure out where the, the meetup will be. Um, photos and hashtag, we use hashtag DrupalNYC on meetup.com, on Twitter, on Instagram, on whatever you use. Uh, we encourage that so you make everybody jealous who wasn't able to be here for Drupal. Um, please support the Drupal Association. Drupal Association does a whole lot of work to make sure like Drupal.org is there as a resource for people. They help with, some, with, the, uh, with the various camps and, and um, they help with DrupalCon and, and all those kind of events, the, the bigger events. Um, and everyone should be supporting Drupal Association. They really make sure this community can grow and thrive. So please uh, just do a quick Google of Drupal Association and, and you'll be able to, to figure out how to join, become a member. Uh, Drupal NYC is about or Slack, so we talked about that. Uh, upcoming events, DrupalCon Seattle is next week. So if you haven't bought your tickets yet, um, now is the time. Um, and uh, there's a library summit at DrupalCon. That's pretty cool. Um, Drupal Delphi is coming up in May. Uh, and you can always go to uh, drupacal.com in order to um, uh, find out about more events. George Mathis and, and me are, are organizing a healthcare summit at DrupalCon. So come. All right. Um, lies. All lies. OK, uh, interested in speaking, if you have a good talk, we are always looking for good speakers. Lightning talks, uh, long kind of involved talks. We've had some really great talks lately. If you're interested in giving talks, please, please, please come and talk to us. Um, if you have a topic that we really should be covering, please come and talk to us, and we'll try and find a good speaker for that topic. Um, that's my five-year-old, but now he's six. Um, he's hiring. Um, actually, he's looking for an internship, if anybody has. Uh, no, OK. Um, who's hiring? Raise your hand. All right, we got one, two, three. All right, Holing, can you come here a sec? Sorry. Holing is going to drive this part of the event because I have to run outside because they're asking questions. Who are you and what's your company? Uh, I am, or we are, whoever they are. Uh, we're Audience View. We're a ticketing uh, company, and we're looking for a senior PHP Drupal developer. Hey, hi. Uh, I'm from Gcom Software, and we are hiring right now for at all level uh, for the Drupal developer from entry level to mid level. So, if anyone's interested, you are 
all, any referral will also do. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm from Shepherds. Uh, this is a company that was started in, in Europe and now we have about 70 developers there and we recently, well about more than a year ago, we started building a, a team here and we are hiring uh, basically all kinds of roles. So primarily, of course, uh, developers, but uh, management, like project management, document management and other management roles as well. So if anyone is interested, then let me know. Thank you. I'm Greg Kallenberg. I'm from the New York Public Library. We're a library, and um, we're looking for a senior application developer um, with uh, AAA skills and um, other skills like Ruby, Java, etc. Who else is hiring? Oh, this is the best part of the meetup. No, I'm kidding. The, the second best part of the meetup. So as an obligation, you guys are required to turn to a person next to you and introduce yourselves to them. Thank you. And stop. And if I did this correctly, if I timed it right, you were right in the middle of the perfect conversation. And so you will now all attend the after drink, after meetup drinks, and you will continue the conversation. Thank you. Give it Cleveland. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, we're back. Here we go. Uh, lightning talk prep. Here we are. Take three minutes. Find a module on Drupal.org that you are ready to talk about for two and a half minutes. Two, it's only two and a half. Two to five minutes, and we're gonna we're gonna come back as a team. All right. And everybody, we're gonna go around the room. Everybody, if you already have one, then that's great. If you're, if you're, you know, if you really don't want to talk, that's okay. You know, no pressure, no pressure, I promise. Um, but we really want to hear about what's the last module you installed that was interesting, right? That wasn't views in Drupal Seven or something like that, right? Um, but what it, what is the last module you looked up and said, "Wow, this thing looks really cool," even if you haven't tried it yet? Um, what's the what's the last problem that you had that you were desperately searching for the is there a module for that answer, right? And let's talk about that problem and, and we'll see if we can crowdsource an answer for you. All right, so everybody take two minutes, three minutes, it says three minutes, so I'm not going to cheat you. Take three minutes, think about what you've been doing lately, think about what your team has been working on lately, all right, and then we're going to go around and we're going to kind of massage this. There you go. Yeah, oh, fair point. Not everybody here knows about Drupal modules. That's a totally fair point. Who, who's here, like, really new to Drupal? And there's no, no, yeah, all right, a couple people. Yeah, and Gergi, yeah, never done Drupal before? No? Okay. Um, no, there are definitely some people here who don't know Drupal. If you don't know about Drupal modules, do a, do a quick Google on Drupal modules, and you'll get to the page that explains them, and that's, that's great. Um, but they're, like, they're the functional building blocks of Drupal, um, uh, you know, Jacob's going to laugh at me when I say this, but Drupal's often described as like Lego blocks, and you pick your Lego block and you put them all together. Um, there's a reason why he's going to laugh at me, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and and you know, from a functional standpoint, for example, there's a module for like commenting. There's a module for making a blog. There's a module for uh, creating a form, a web form. There's a module for creating what are called paragraphs. What the hell are these paragraph things? Do you have that burning question? Let that be your burning question, and we'll, you know, someone will give a two a two minute answer on what paragraphs are in the, the context of Drupal. So, everyone, take your two minutes. There's only two left now. And we're going to come around the room, okay? And begin. Dead silence. No one's looking at a computer. No one's doing anything. Does, does <laughs> I'm going to make. I'm going to leave the, the silence as an awkward silence for a minute. <laughs> yeah.
are, well, you got 30 more seconds. All right, and I'm going to go first to, uh, to break the ice. You ready? Oh, see, everybody got into it. I, I left too much silence. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually talk about two modules, and I'm going to do it in, in, in four minutes, so two, two minutes per module. One of them, a lot of you who, who have heard me talk before, is my favorite module because it's my module, that I, it's my baby that I've, I've loved for years and years, is the focal point module. What the focal point module does is it allows you, as an editor, when you upload a, a photo as part of your blog post or your article or whatever your content type is, when you upload a photo, you can stick, there's a little hash mark that, that shows up on your photo and you can put it wherever you want on the photo. And if you set up your image styles correctly in Drupal 7 or Drupal 8, then when that image gets cropped, any size, any, any ratio, however it gets cropped, it doesn't matter. When it gets cropped, wherever you as an editor had put that little hash sign, it's going to do its best to make sure that that spot is in the middle of the image when it gets cropped. So imagine a red carpet photo of some very tall person, right? You don't want it to crop right here, I mean, unless you're selling belts or something, but you don't want it to crop here, you probably want it to crop on the person's nose or on the person's feet if you're doing like a thing about shoes, all right? So that's the focal point module. It makes it really, really easy for editors to just say, oh, and this is the important part of the image. And then the system can use that information later to decide how to crop that image. The second one I'm going to do is I'm going to answer the question that I, I posed to the group a few minutes ago, which is, what in, in the context of Drupal, what the hell is a paragraph, right? It's a weird, um, it's a weird name, in my opinion, and um, it takes a, a little bit of, of you know, using to get used to the idea of paragraphs. But the basic idea is this. Imagine that you have this lovely WYSIWYG, you know, form, you know, and you can type anything you want. You can make paragraphs, you can put an image in there, you can, you know, move the image over to the left side or the right side, you can, you know, uh, make it three columns or two columns, you can do all sorts of things like that in terms of laying out your actual content, right? The body of your page, the body of your article or blog posts. Well, there's not great ways to do that. It can be done using the like rich text editor buttons that come with Drupal 8 now, right? You can do it, but nah, not really, nah. And you may want to have much more, as a developer, as a site developer, or as a themer, you may want to have much more fine-tuned control over letting your users, right, your editors, your content creators, say, here's the, you know, here's the image, here's this, you know, this bit of text and this bit of text and this bit of text, but I, the, the designer of this site, I am going to like do all the hard work and the heavy lifting of making sure that it gets um, displayed correctly as three columns of text and an image or something like that. I'm going to let you choose, right, which kind of layout you want for these different paragraphs of your content, right? Maybe the first paragraph you want to have an image and float the text to the right, and then your second paragraph, paragraph, you're going to want to have um, a, you know, kind of a, a couple of links to some files, and then, the, you know, or some, some some related articles that that an, you know an editor chooses. And then your next paragraph is is just the body of text, right? Maybe that's how you want it set up. Well, I'll let you choose between those three types of things, and then on the next article, you could choose the links first and the thing with the image third, and the body of text in the middle, or, or however you want to do it as an editor. So paragraphs is a way that you can set up your uh, site so that editors can kind of structure their content and not worry about, is this going to lay out correctly? Is this going to look right on the 900 different devices we all have to check now, right, when we want to when we want to do our content, right? A site builder, when they're not thinking about the middle of the page, they, they can do all sorts of crazy things to make sure it looks right on a huge screen and a tiny screen and everything in between, but if they don't know what the content is going to be because it hasn't been written yet, they can't do much about that. 
right? But with Power Graphs, you're, you, the editor, are now structuring the content so that I, the site builder, can know, oh, there's going to be different structures to this content. I don't know what the content is yet, but there's going to be, if, if the paragraph type that they chose was a floated image, I know there will be an image and I know there will be text. If the paragraph type that they chose was a, um, a list of links, I know there will be a list of links provided to me and I can design my theme for my site to be prepared for a list of links or be prepared for a floated image with some text. All right, so that's kind of the basic idea of paragraphs. That's probably not the greatest explanation in the world, but hopefully I, I got you know the basics in there and, and I've intrigued some of you who are thinking, oh, paragraphs, maybe I'll take a look and see what that really does and get a better explanation. So, who has another module that they would like to talk about? Matt. Okay. Okay, show of hands, who's ever heard of Matama, if I'm pronouncing it correctly? Matama, formerly known as Piwik, or, I, I'm, again, I don't know of any, the pronunciations of anything here. Okay, cool, one person. Okay, well, um, so basically, the, um, the, the, the use case was uh, the Drupal site that I was, that I'm running was originally outside my company's firewall, now it was pulled behind the firewall, and then I could no longer use Google Analytics because IT security wouldn't open a port. And uh, Google Analytics, at least when I was using it, needed to go back and uh, send data back and forth to uh, the Google system. So um, it was really, I was r I've been running blind, not knowing what people are searching, I mean, with the even with the tools that came with the box, and I'm still on the Drupal site. So uh, this Matamo, what used to be called Piwik, um, is an open source uh, analytics package that you can either, again, they have the cloud service, you could, you could, but you would have to have access to it, or you can install it internally on your own server, and um, it basically does the same thing. I haven't gotten to work yet. I just, we just installed it last week, but um, I, there's a lot of tweaking, so that I can tell you, if you want hours and hours of pain from a site builder, I can share that with you, but that's. All right, thank you, Matt. Matamo, spell that. M-A-T-O-M-O. M-A-T-O-M-O. Matamo. All right, so I've never heard of that one. I'm gonna look that one up. All right, who else has a, an interesting module? Scott. Okay. All right, this is my, my gym time. <laughs> Go ahead. And just a quick closing. The great part, Matano, is you can actually write code to do whatever you want on analytics. It'll give you a good module. It's module filter in the back end. It really helps you clean up and find the module you want with the dependencies, and it makes your life so much easier. And if you have a lot of modules and you need to change, you don't have to scroll down for two, three days to get to the bottom of the page. It's right there. Nice, clean. It's one of the first things I, I install whenever I do a new install. Module filter was one of my favorite modules in the world, so much so that one of one of my contributions to the Drupal 8 build was getting that, you know when you go to the module page and you have that little text box at the top and you just type? That was me, baby. Yeah. And mo module filter does that in Drupal 7 and it does that and 100, you know, it does, it makes that module page like way nicer in Drupal 8, so I, I recommend it as well. Good call, Scott. All right, who else got one? You know you want to. No. One, two, yeah, no. Oh, oh, we got one. What's your favorite module in two minutes or less, and why? Favorite module in Drupal is not necessarily the favorite right now. Is something called migration tools. Um, I was tasked with migrating a website that didn't have any kind of database backend. Its backend was a bunch of Markdown files and migration tools is a way of transforming HTML in a migration script and turning it into fields that you can migrate. So it's just saved my life. <laughs> there you go. That's a great one. Migration tools, uh, and it does a lot more than that. It'll do it'll do CSV files in, in funky ways. It'll it really gives you a lot of, of cool control when you're doing your migrations over and above the migrations that you know the migration scripts that exist in V8 already. What else we got? Come on, someone's got a favorite module. Someone's got one. Ah, yes. 
It's called the GraphQL Search API. Mm. Um, it basically allows you to do searches over a REST API. Um, right out of the box, no code. Mm -hmm. um, and it's super nice. Uh, integrates with whatever is plugged into the Search API. So Solar or Elasticsearch, it's really nice. Yeah, good one. One of the things we've been doing lately is we've been using uh, a, a, a offering by Amazon called AppSync, which is a total misnomer it's in, in its name, so that we can have an Elasticsearch backend for, you know, for indexed content, and we can use GraphQL in order to access it, in order to access that data, um, rather than the kind of normal, typical Elasticsearch you know, que query, I'm using quote marks, but the, the Elasticsearch query that you would normally write. Um, and it's worked really nicely for us. We found a bug in it in, on my team, which I think is awesome. When your team can find a bug in Amazon's code, it feels really good to call them up and say, we found a bug in your code, and they go, oh, shh, yes, you did. And then they fix it for you, and it's great. Um, so that was a good, a, good, a good moment for my team lately. No, no, it wasn't that good of a bug. <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay, it's um, password policy, okay. which uh, is very nice for securing passwords. Um, you can set v various constraints on passwords like uppercase, lowercase, mm -hmm. symbols, numbers, alphabetics, non-alphabetics, um, password expiration, the number of times you can try it before you get locked out and how long you get locked out for. Um, so it's a great module. Currently for Drupal 8, it's still in alpha, um, and I know there's a bug in it that I'm, that's in the dev branch, but still not available in, in uh, I asked for another alpha, so hopefully there will be one soon or a beta, but anyway, try that module, it's great, if you, if you need extra security on your passwords. That sounds good, password policy module, all right, that's the one, all the, every time you've ever gone to a website and you didn't remember your password, and you realize, oh, sh is this one of those websites that I have to use two exclamation points and nine, you know, underscores, and uh, that's the module for you, right? All right, what else? Who is, who's got one? Here we go. Just a small module. It's called a Play Pong Monkey Face. Sorry, but I use it for Drupal 8, and it's great because it sets up that you can have extra fonts come in, and you can actually put code in a template, but this way it's all in one place instead of trying to put it into a module, and it connects with the data type kit, and then you can have use of your Drupal fonts. So it's really good. Okay. That's another good one. Another good one. Font your face. It's got a great name, too, right? Font your face. <laughs> JD? JD's got a couple. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. oh. All right. He's bringing props. Uh, yeah. What are you doing? Are you no, no. Right here. Right here. Right here. Oh, well, we got this, right? Okay. So, this building was built in 1930. No. Uh, we'll get that later. All right. Um, let me hit the button in the back. Blammo. Uh. <laughs> Did it go away? It went away. Oh, no. There, I saw it. I'm eavesdropping on the conversation over there, and yes, NBC has a shit ton of huge TVs. All right, go ahead. There we go. All right, so um, the theme for our modules today originally was meant to be little known modules. So in order uh, from least known to most known, but still not very well known, <coughs> uh, this is asynchronous prefetch database query cache. <laughs> APD. It just rolls off the tongue. It does. APDQC is the, uh, the machine name for that module. <coughs> um, <coughs> You might use this module if you're dealing with a uh, very high performance website or where you really need to inch out like every little extra bit of performance. Um, and this provides a whole bunch of different optimizations <coughs> um, related to database. Um, so 
you know, Drupal, uh, <laughs> there's a lot going on under the hood. <clears throat> and uh, this module helps eliminate some database locks. Sometimes you run into lock errors when there's a lot of traffic. Um, what else does it do? Uh, it does a whole bunch of stuff <laughs> um, that I don't really understand fully. But um, I have used it. It has some uh, great documentation. Uh, and it does help uh, provide some performance um, benefits that uh, you're just not going to get otherwise unless um, you're really tuning your you know, MySQL database uh, on your own and maybe adding in some of your own uh, custom performance patches. So this can be a great way to just speed up your site uh, just a little bit extra, um, but definitely recommend it only for more advanced uh, developers who kind of understand what, what's going on uh, and what it's doing, uh, hopefully better than me. Oops, I forgot to change tabs. While he's figuring out how to change tabs, speaking of modules that are little known, there's a great YouTube channel called the Drupal 1%. And it's Drupal, and they go through Drupal modules that are out there that have fewer than one percent of like the Drupal sites out in the world using it. So it's the Drupal one percent, or not something like that. But it's it's actually it's very good. It's very well done, and they, they go through some really interesting modules. Back to you. All right. Next up is Stage File Proxy. This one you might have actually heard of. Um, if you follow best practices for Drupal de development and you have multiple environments, uh, one production environment maybe a staging environment, testing environment, development environment, maybe local development environments, um, <clears throat> particularly if you're dealing with a very large um, set of files. Um, so if it's a, a website that has a lot of content, maybe a lot of images that get uploaded by users or by uh, content editors, um, it can take a long time to sync all those files down to your uh, local machine uh, or to uh, your other environments that are not your production environments. <clears throat> so the stage file proxy module is fantastic. Uh, you can install it um, you know, on any environment uh, besides your production environment. And then uh, when you know, an image is requested um, on one of those other environments, it will actually pull that image down from the production environment, um, create a copy on you know, that local environment or your uh, development or staging environment, uh, and then that will be available uh, for your use. So it means you don't have to wait as a developer for the whole set of files to sync down, all the images and other uploads, um, and uh, can save you a whole bunch of time. Definitely recommend it. Just bear in mind that it may make your stage environment, if that's where you're using it, respond a little bit slower, right? Um, it, because it's grabbing you know, images from elsewhere and it takes a minute. It also has some quirks if your, like the thing you're testing has to do with generating image derivatives, right? So there, it can get a little bit quirky with that. But that's not mo in most cases, most people, that's not the issue that, they're, that they're, they're looking at. But just know that if that's the thing you're really testing, um, that don't don't you know turn it off and don't use it for that moment. Back to you. Cool. All right. Last one. Uh, corresponding entity references. Uh, who has heard of corresponding entity references? Show of hands. All right. Some people. <laughs> um, so you might have heard of corresponding node references in earlier version of Drupal. Um, so this is the successor to that, and um, this basically allows you to take an entity reference field or a taxonomy reference field, one of those guys, uh, similar ones. Um, and you can basically link uh, the entity reference field on one entity or node to that on another. Um, so if you imagine a, uh, a website that tracks uh, artist uh, discographies, right, all their albums and stuff, you might have uh, an artist node, and that artist node might have an entity reference field that references all of the albums that that artist has created. And then you might have uh, an album node, and the album node would have an entity reference field that references the artist. Um, and so the corresponding entity references module allows you to configure those two entity reference uh, fields to point to each other so that if you um, add an album uh, to the artist to the <laughs> to the artist node field that points to the album, uh, it gets updated on the other one and vice versa. Um, and you can configure whether it's a one way or two way uh, kind of sync of data. Um, so that can be a great way to uh, maybe reduce the amount of effort that content editors, uh, need to make when they're, uh, you know, filling out uh, the forms on the website to add content. Um, lots of great uses for that. Uh, only note is it can have performance implications because then whenever you save uh, one node, um, it'll update uh, potentially, you know, the other nodes that it references. So depending on your site setup, uh, you got to be really careful with that one, but very useful. Awesome. Thank you, JD. All right, let's get let's get one one more good juicy node. A node module. So Neil, Neil, do you have a favorite module that you've been playing with lately? 
No, nothing, nothing. No one, no one. All right, Matt. Matt's got one more. I feel it would be inappropriate in this group to go without mentioning the web form uh, module, since even though I've never used it, I've heard approximately 10 presentations on in both New Jersey and New York on it. And so one of these days, I'm going to get to use it. For, for those of you who haven't heard about that module, so um, it's, a, it's a really, really powerful module. If you ever want to have your end users kind of filling out forms, so typical use cases, I want to like have you know, a, a survey, and I want my end users to fill out a, a form to answer my survey. It, with no coding whatsoever, you can set this thing up. Very, very powerful, and, and you can set up almost any type of question you can imagine, almost any type of form widget you could think of, and you can get that data back out in, in an Excel spreadsheet and start playing with it with your coworkers or in 19 other different you know formats, and it really it does some amazing stuff. So we've heard about it a lot because someone in this room may be somewhat um, involved in the creation and building of it. Jacob. Okay. Um, yay. All right. Uh, is that my last chance? Here we go. Last chance. Uh, oh, we got one. All right. One last one. I work on a site that sends out tens of thousands of emails a week. And uh, something critical for us developers is reroute email. Um, we actually have it hardwired um, in the config files so that it is always uh, enabled on our multi devs and Pantheon and locally. So basically, is yeah enabled anything that anywhere that is not live, um, so that we don't accidentally send ten thousand emails. Reroute email. That's a good one. Hold on. I've seen this one because I've, I've had a problem because I've never I send out a lot of emails. Uh, I, there's a mail log module that is. What's the difference between mail log? What it does is it'll catch it and then create logs of the emails going out and it'll show it on screen. So the reason I recommend that a lot is because it shows people, you know, like you're debugging an email and trying to see how it looks. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see it. This just is a way of intercepting every single. Everything that Drupal Mail sends, it's just like a black hole, basically. It sends it to DevNull, but not DevNull, but my Gmail email. Um, okay. I actually had to Gmail, a, you know, we, we, we sent so many that I actually had to send an endpoint on Amazon to accept these because Gmail thought that it was getting a response from the web server and was stopping, the Gmail was starting to block the email from going in to send this email. Yeah, it's called, yeah, the one that I've been using for a while is MailLog, which is, it's sim, it's, it's different. It, it like, it'll even track, it'll log and still send them out or just stop them completely. It sounds like, it sounds like, yeah, well, MailHog is a separate application. That's yeah. another another solution. To that. But it sounds like for the one that you're looking at, Jacob, is, is more useful if you actually want to debug the emails and you want to like see what's going on. Whereas the one that you're talking about is useful for, I don't I, like we we finished that development a year ago. We're good with that. We don't need to see these things anymore. We just don't want to accidentally send an email to all of our customers that says, you know, Lorem Ipsum, you know, right? All right, all right. This was great. Thank you, everybody. Hand to everybody. Thank you for participating. What did everybody, real quick, quick snap poll. What did everybody think of that? You all like that? Yeah? Kind of participatory uh, time. Good, we like it. Okay. Um, I will stand here with all three microphones like this. Um, okay. Um, yes. Adriana, come on up. Um, I don't remember what the name of your talk was, and I don't remember what the subject is, but I bet it's going to be awesome. Um, we're going to find out. Oh, good. Okay. All right, do you want a handheld, or do you want to no, use that guy? Okay. Take it away. I always find it a bit funny to speak into the Microphones. Um, let me know when I can use the slides. Um, but anyway, until that is being uh, set up here, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Adriana. 
uh, thank you for being here versus going to the Game of Thrones, whatever event they had down there. Uh, we were all very excited to see that. And if you're a fan, yay. Um, even more so, thank you for being here and not going there. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of things today uh, regarding paragraphs. It was working before. It was. JD, you screwed it up. I'm blaming JD. Yes, we got it. Okay. Ah, great okay. success. So we're just going to turn on the presenter mode. Okay, we have that. Uh, this is a very long title, but the basic idea is that we're going to talk about paragraphs and about how we build websites uh, generally. A little bit about myself. Um, I'm a senior project manager at FFW. Maybe you've heard about us, maybe not. Um, I've been a project manager for seven plus years, and most of my experience has been with Drupal. Um, I'd like to think that I know a lot about it, although there's still always uh, a lot of things to learn. And as people say, the more you know, the more you realize that you don't really know a lot of stuff. Uh, so always be a constant learner. Uh, fun story about how I got here, actually. Uh, so last year I was at the meetup. Before that, I kind of submitted the idea for a presentation. Uh, and then this year, JD contacted me and said, oh, hey, you want to do that? And I'm like, yes, I'll be in New York on this date. Can I do it then? Uh, and then we set up this, and I'm super happy to be here and to share some of our tips and uh, things for how we do stuff. Um, when thinking about the audience for tonight, kind of thought that because a lot of people work with Drupal, probably you're going to fall into one of these three categories. Maybe there's something else that I didn't think about. Um, so the first one is hopefully you'll find out something new and you'll try to implement it in your future projects. The second one is maybe you'll just solidify some of the knowledge that you have and say, oh, Everyone else is doing it, I'm doing it, so I guess we're on the right track. <laughs> or the third one would be that you didn't really learn anything new. Hopefully, you won't fall into that category. But if you are, um, you know, just let me know. And if you'll have any other tips for maybe how you're doing things with paragraphs or how you're building websites, I think it would be great to share some of that experience and actually discuss about what would be some of the best practices that everyone can implement in the future. So, um, in regards to how it all started, a while back we partnered with Prologis to rebuild their website in Drupal 8. Uh, this is how the website looked before we started to work on it. Um, this was back in 2016, I believe. Um, so, Drupal 8 generally was kind of at the beginning, everyone, it was in the early adoption stages. There were still a lot of modules that were not available compared to what people were used to doing in Drupal 7. There was still a very huge learning curve that everyone in development teams was planning to do and have. But we definitely knew that this is something that we need to get started with, and it's the right choice and solution that we need to choose uh, to have in the future. So um, what we had to do, of course, was to build a website with a new design. Uh, we always strive to have an easy-to-use content management system and to have as much flexibility as possible while not overwhelming the content editors because it's good to have flexibility in such a way that you empower the editors but not overwhelm them with too many choices and make it too complex for them to try to figure out what is going on on this page and how do I actually need to get to what I need. Um, we always go with the approach that every page is a node. Uh, that's something that probably a lot of you do in the development, uh, but that empowers people to control what they're going to get on those pages and to have more flexibility around how they look. Um, we already knew that we wanted to use paragraphs. Um, in Drupal 7, I think from a timing perspective, in Drupal 7, they appeared kind of later in the game. Everyone was just used to doing, I think, panels and panes and like a lot of things like that. I have a screenshot coming up because uh, I always like to compare how, I'd say in retrospective, things look, looked a little bit bad <laughs> because there's a lot of 
things that you can do with paragraphs in a better way compared to how we were doing those in Drupal 7. Um, now, one of the things that we um, as a company always do is that we try to explain the Drupal concepts to the clients that we work with. So as Alex was explaining paragraphs today, we try to do that as well. We explain what a content type is, we explain what a taxonomy is, we explain what that is used for. Because we believe that this knowledge sharing empowers them to know uh, how the website is going to work and how they can use their knowledge and leverage that in the future things that they're going to do. Um, so that's how something looked in Drupal 7. Looks very different in Drupal 8. <laughs> but um, yeah, we discussed a little bit about the challenges that we faced. However, um, I'd say one of the most important things when working with paragraphs in general is uh, having the mindset of working with components. And that's something that um, I'd say starts with design and it starts with the content. So if you look at this slide next, maybe you've seen that. You, when you design something, you always go from smaller components and then try to mix and match them so that they will present the different content that you have. Um, I'm a believer that content should drive design because once you understand what is the content that you need to present on your website to serve your target audiences, you can also understand how to better present that so that it fits their needs and it actually uh, serves the purpose that they're looking to get from your website. Um, maybe you've seen this before, uh, but basically we try to combine a lot of things so that at the end of the day, we have, um, let's call it a style guide, a database of all different elements that we can combine to make beautiful content and to serve a lot of the different paragraphs that we have. Um, you can see here a couple of examples where kind of going from, uh, sorry, going from a very basic type of style guide, we mix and match to serve the different contents that we have with the different styles. So we have different types of buttons, we have facts that have headline, that have footnotes, we have web forms and all of the things related to that. So um, generally the approach that we also follow is reusability in regards to styles and components. This is very important for development, for front end, for content strategy moving forward as well and just trying to make sure that if you invest the time in something, it's going to be uh, productive and then it's going to get you a high return of the time invested. Here's, there's a couple of other examples for uh, once again serving different types of purposes with, um, of content with very similar styles and ideas for how they work. Okay, we're gonna go quickly through that and we'll get to another uh, important stage in all projects, which is where when you have all designs ready. So kind of assuming that you went through a content strategy exercise, you went through designs and you have everything approved. What we usually do next is that we, um, you know, need to get started on development. But before we do that, there's one important step that we do, uh, which is called specifications creation. Um, I really like to do this by looking at all the designs and um, when the designs are ready and approved because it gives you a very clear picture of what needs to be on the website and how exactly you can um, build the different components that you have and the different paragraphs and how everything is related to one another. So usually during various discussions with the clients, you'll get um, details about, you know, on the news page, you need to list these amount of items based on these criteria and all the details related to that. But the news um, view mode may look very similar to the event view mode. There's a lot of other similarities that you can find based on that design. So then you can make better decisions about how to approach the development and how to do a lot of these technical decisions for the project so that it serves for a better purpose. So the way we would um, evaluate the pages and the various paragraphs that we would need to build and how the pages generally would be laid out 
if we take a look at just these two pages <laughs> before I move forward to the next slide, uh, there's a couple of elements that you can see that are common here. So we have the banner at the top. In this case, we have the same similar banner, which is a slider, and it has a different background color. Uh, we also have uh, one column layout on that side. We have a two columns layout on this side. Um, and then we have a lot of similar elements in regards to their presentation for how everything is uh, laid out. So by looking at these two, um, there's a couple of things. And these are just two illustrations. We would basically have all of the designs and then that will help us make all of the decisions in the project. Um, but there's a couple of things that we can um, draw from looking at those visuals. We can uh, separate what are the visual regions of different pages and how we can structure the content so that it uh, visually fits those and how editors can understand, oh, if I add this component here, it's going to go in the sidebar. If I add this here, it's going to go in the header. If I add this in another place, it's going to go in the content area of the page. Uh, we identify all the different page layouts that might be needed. Um, we identify the elements that are present on all the pages. So let's say the banner, um, and then how that gets to be rebuilt. And then how do we actually have a banner that is also a slider by reusing the same paragraph. And uh, we try to do this in such a way that we document things enough to get us to work and to avoid ambiguity with the client or any misunderstandings. But at the same time, we try to strive for simplicity and we don't want to get stuck in the documentation, in the documentation process. So I think that's very important because sometimes when you do a lot of that, there might be a risk that it takes either too much time or it's too complex and people don't really know what to do with it afterwards. So do it enough to get you to the needed results. Okay. So. Once again, if we take a look at that, um, these are um, some section pages, as we will call them, uh, because they present some very general content. And the way we kind of structured this is by creating a content type, which is called section page. You can call it in very different ways. Um, and we have these uh, visual regions over there that are appearing, where people can add all of the different paragraphs. They can also choose the layout. Now, I know there's layout builder coming up and something that we will need to use. I think we're all very excited for that and how it's going to look. But back when we implemented this, we didn't have that. So that's what we came up with. Um, and then basically, if you would expand these, you would be able to add various paragraphs that could be added in those sections. Um, and they would appear on the page. Um, by having this, and by having absolutely all of the elements added there, um, it gives editors a lot of control and understanding of what is going to appear on that page without surprises of having something appearing out of the blue or not understanding how exactly it's going to work. Now, in regards to paragraphs definition and other components that we do, uh, we usually have this combination of, I would say, a little bit technical, but also functional type of specifications, where we also coordinate with the client what are the exact details that are going to uh, be present in different uh, paragraphs. So we do screenshots, and then on the other side, we do uh, the description and the fields that are available as well. So you can see that we go um, and outline absolutely everything. We also have different styles of the banner that control the color. And then we also say what exactly is going to be displayed when we actually view this component. Uh, so this, again, makes it very easy. And the client feels in control. And they are informed before we actually get to implement something, which makes things a lot easier in the communication. And then they know what to expect as a result. These are a couple of other examples for how we combine different things and how we find a lot of similarities. You can see that um, in this case, we have various components that are, um, or various uh, illustrations of the same component. In this case, it's nested with other components, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but basically, we have all of these different representations and then the description for all of those. 
Okay. Um, this is an example of various flexible layouts with style. Uh, again, as Alex was saying, sometimes you want the image to be on the left, sometimes you want that to be on the right, sometimes you want that to be stacked. Um, with paragraphs, you can very easily control how to do that. And the biggest advantage of using that versus using any WYSIWYG type of control is that, especially when you have a lot of editors, you also need to take into account the governance of the styles that you have on the website, because if a lot of people will do the content editing exactly as they want, the website or the pages may not follow the brand uh, guidelines. So to protect a lot of the things, we kind of give you flexibility enough to do things in a nice way, but we still control what exactly you can do. Now, when it comes to nesting paragraphs, we had a lot of situations when we kind of had elements within elements. So you can see here a couple of examples where we have that headline and description at the top and the bottom. And then inside of that, we kind of had these type of content collections. So because the design was kind of constructed like this, we also had to nest different paragraphs. And um, you know, that wasn't exactly very difficult to do. <laughs> uh, but we just had to think about how to exactly uh, separate all of the different paragraphs and how exactly they will work in such a way that um, everything will make sense from an editorial perspective as well as future maintenance. This is another example. So we have, um, we called this big piece a letters paragraph and then each individual letter, when you hover over it or when you click over it, it would have a different image and different text appearing. So that was a letter list and then a letter paragraph inside of it. In terms of editing, that's kind of how it looked like. <laughs> Uh, so you can see the nesting that goes inside and then understand how everything is structured. So again, uh, when people are going in and editing, they have all the content in one place, they know they, that they can edit it here and everything works out as expected. If they want to move the letters around, they can very easily do that and they don't have any surprises afterwards for how things are going to appear on the page. Um, so. When we do specs, we kind of do all of these individual components when we have paragraphs, and then we also do the various page components. So let's say uh, this is a slider that also is nested inside a flexible content paragraph. So if we would have a page specification, we would say that you know this is a flexible content paragraph, and inside of it, you'll have this component. So then again, this gives everyone clarity for how the page is going to be built. And if you need to train a lot of editors in the future, you can use these documents as a starting point, and then you can um, develop things on top of that to actually create even um, better user manuals for a big team of editors that you may need to have on site. Now, um, one of the other challenges that we had back then was um, trying to have featured content in different pages of the website, which were mostly nodes um, that we wanted to manually control to appear there in specific ways. Um, there's the node queue module, which we can use, but we didn't want to use that because we wanted, every time you create a node queue, that requires a slightly different knowledge set than using a paragraph. So what we came up with is something called the content queue, which is basically a paragraph <laughs> uh, that you can use to add various node references to something that you have on the website. And with our content queue, because we wanted to have various types of content, we also created various styles for it. So you can see here that we have, like in the style field, these would be the options that we have. So we have an employee story list, a general fact, a market slider, a lot of other things that we identified were needed. And that was very helpful because everyone was able to go in, select what they wanted to feature, and then reference those nodes. So very simple and easy to use. And you know, just going to the same idea that paragraphs are awesome, <laughs> we generally try to paragraph absolutely everything unless we cannot really do something. So we add um, everything with paragraphs, 
various views, various forms, um, a lot of the other things that are needed. And then when we build a page, this is one example of those section pages. Um, so we have various um, section paragraphs and inside of them we have other nested elements which if we click on edit, we um, can kind of see all of the other items that are nested in there. So in regards to where the website is now, we, we launched the initial version of the website in 2017. That was a while back. Uh, we launched one website and then we converted this in a multi-site installation, which currently has 13 websites and it's a multilingual installation as well. Uh, we have a uh, various number of languages on the different websites. The maximum is five languages. We have around 50 paragraphs and um, we have, you know, all of this flexible page building that goes on for different pages. Uh, in some cases, editors were creative and they were trying to use even various use cases that we didn't really think about, but they were serving some other content needs that they have. Um, and the client is happy with the setup and the build and the flexibility that they have, uh, but also with the fact that, you know, it's not going over the top and being too complex to manage. Um, in terms of the future, we do want to improve the interface of working with paragraphs. So we are always looking out for something else that comes up on the market because we understand that you know, even with the current setup that we have, there are things that could be improved. But at the same time, um, we, want to be, we want to invest the time in good solutions and not just experimenting with absolutely everything because there's a governance of the current content that we still need to keep in mind. So if we, we were building something from scratch, maybe there's a lot more experimentation that can be going on. But with a website that already exists, we have to be cautious with the uh, new initiatives that we are introducing in the project. Um, we also want to add more regression testing tools because that's always important when you work with a lot of websites and big builds and a lot of paragraphs and a lot of reusability of elements because when you change something in one place, it can affect things in other places that maybe you didn't think about. <laughs> so it's good to have those type of tools. Um, if needed, we'll add more paragraphs and reuse them across all the various websites. And there's other functionalities that we're adding constantly on the platform to serve the business and whatever they need to have. So with that ending note, <laughs> I have this slide again. So to make this a little bit interactive, uh, this is, um, maybe you can raise your hands to understand what category you were placed in. Uh, so that's one of the things. And then the second one would be if you want to share your experience a little bit for working with uh, paragraphs and all of the things related to that, I guess that would be nice to do. So who here found out something new today? Yay, whoa, <laughs> that's a lot of hands. That's great to see. Uh, who solidified the knowledge and saw that we're kind of doing the same thing? Okay, that's good. And who learned, who didn't learn anything new or who noticed something and said, oh, we will never do that. <laughs> or at least thank you that you didn't raise the hand. <laughs> um, okay, so that is my ending note. And I think it would be great to do a little bit of uh, exchange of experiences if you want to share your thoughts on the presentation or on how you do things with paragraphs and with site building. I have, I have questions as well, other than okay. about your implementation. Um, so the first one is, I mean, paragraphs tend to create a lot of very ad hoc pages. How do you make a page repeatable without a lot of editor training and having them still make mistakes? By repeatable, do you mean um, copying the same type of content, or? Well, I, for example, if if you create a content type rather mm -hmm. than a page with paragraphs, right? It's going to come out the same every time. The layout's going to be the same unless you change view mode, but that's 
still locked down. Whereas on Paragraph, you can, the content editor pretty much controls how the pages are laid. So it's very easy for them to break the standards without even realizing it. Right. Um, so we are using the approach of um, building the uh, page by using only paragraphs for the section pages because we know um, in those sec in for those segment of pages we would really need to think about all of the components that go on the page and uh, the various content that goes on them. For everything that is more standard, we use the content type we've built so that we make sure um, things don't get messed up and reorganized in different ways. Um, in some cases, we may want to have um, various layouts. So let's say if we have a news page that may have two different styles, um, even if it has the same fields that you complete, but if you want to have a featured type of news, um, maybe we'll do that by having a field layout where you kind of choose the style that should appear there. Uh, in a lot of situations, we may also have areas that are uh, fixed as fields, but there is one flexible area where you can actually add content that uh, is using paragraphs. Uh, we have a lot of examples like that. Um, so basically, uh, what I'm thinking about is something like an infographic type of page. Uh, where you have a couple of details that are very standard for all the infographics, but the actual report about it can use sometimes videos, can use images, can use full uh, with elements. So then you need to be able to control that a little bit. So we try to uh, standardize those fields that are common. And then whenever we understand that there's flexibility that needs to happen, we try to allow that for those components. Um, another way for how we do that is by trying to limit the type of paragraphs that you can add either in the different content types or in the different areas. So then you only have a limited selection for things that you can add there. I, I've hit this and I've used no, or Entity Clone. So it doesn't prevent them from making that mistake that you're talking <laughs> about, but it gives them, you know, the, the, the get the, gets them going, you know, gets them on the ground. And we've used I, um, I have more. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, on the entity clone things, um, there's a couple of modules that do a similar functionality regarding that. Uh, we found some issues with them, especially when working with multilingual and with various paragraphs. And if you have content moderation, so if you mix all of those things up, sometimes you'll find issues. So just be aware. <laughs> okay. Another question. Sure. Um, on SEO. It's very, I, I've worked on some sites with paragraphs where the problem that we came across was you would have an H1 tag below an H2 tag. How do you, how do you address right. that issue? Uh, so again, this comes with uh, limiting the paragraphs that you can add. And in a lot of the situations when we have paragraphs that have these headlines, we usually also add the heading uh, field where you can choose the markup that is going to be added for like the title field or the subheading field or things like that. So we kind of give people the flexibility of controlling that. Um, there is a little bit of editor training that needs to go into this as well. Um, but I would say, you know, the best idea would be to try to limit what you can do. Um, other than that, if you reuse things, there's always going to be a risk that unfortunately someone will mess it up because we're all humans and humans make mistakes. <laughs> okay, one more. Sure. Um, you said you, you're doing multilingual. Multilingual has been a problem with paragraphs because the paragraphs are independent entities from the page and if you go to submit the page for translation, the entities don't get translated along with the page. Mm -hmm. So how do, how do you, what's your process for translating the entities properly? Um, so I know there's a couple of settings which are a little bit more technical and I don't really know how they're called, but I'll explain this from an editorial perspective. Um, so whenever we uh, translate the page, um, generally our websites have the English language as the original language. 
Uh, so the content is created kind of in that uh, language first, but not necessarily. And then when you click on translate, it um, saves the exact same copy that you have in English uh, with the exact same paragraphs and content and everything. Um, and then you can just edit the content whenever you go to the, let's say if you have English and French, um, you click to translate French, that copies absolutely everything over uh, from the English version with the same uh, structure that you have. And then you can go in and edit in French the content that you need. Um, if you need more details on how that is done, I can look it up. I know we, because uh, there's two options that you can go with, either by doing that, where things are saved exactly in the same way, uh, or by having um, various content on the various translations. So that's, um, yeah. Um, we can, I can figure out the details and I can send them over to you. <laughs> If you submitted, so if you if you wanted to translate a page that had paragraphs in it, um, and you said, "All right, I, I want a French version of this," mm -hmm. um, when you save that page, the entity references would not get saved anymore. You would, so you would end up with a bunch of empty paragraphs and a base page that was saved in the wrong language. I don't know if paragraphs has changed since the last time. We don't have that issue. I'm not sure if it's uh, something that was fixed or if it's something that we fixed, but we haven't had an issue with that, with references or with anything, based on how things are set up now. I saw recently with LingoTech, because I was peeking at what they're working on, and they, they're trying, like, if you're on a node and you go to translate it and it's got paragraphs, it starts just scanning through those entity revisions, like the, the references, and pushes them up with it. It's like a setting to kind of, and that's crazy. Like <laughs> the, the, just a technical challenge with paragraphs yeah. is um, the nesting gets really crazy. Yes. Like, <laughs> I'll be honest, I saw one where I was like, this is crazy. They did a location content type. There was a paragraph and the address for the location was nested two layers down into the paragraph as arbitrary data. Okay. And that's really hard. You, you can't, it's not exposed. You can't get to it. It's kind of a useless way to do it. So you have to be really careful. I think what you guys are doing is kind of great. It's content. Yeah. It's not the meta rich data that people need to sort and filter by. Um, if you have that, probably use a separate field. <laughs> uh, but yes, it can be challenging when doing those things with paragraphs. Um, it can also be challenging if from one paragraph you want to convert things to use another one. Uh, and then you need to figure out what are the pages that are using that paragraph that we're getting rid of uh, so that we can clean that up. It's kind of difficult to find that out, again, because of how paragraphs work and how they are kind of referenced to nodes, but also kind of difficult to find to what nodes they are being used on. Um, so there are some challenges, of course, but there's also a lot of advantages that using paragraphs brings to the table. So that's why we like using them. Another question, JD. Um, okay, question about uh, revisioning. Was that a requirement um, for your uh, content editors to be able to revert content if they made a mistake or they needed to kind of get back to a previous state? And how did that work with the nested paragraphs? Were there any issues there? Uh, we do have revisioning. Um, because we've built this a while back, I don't recall any exact issues that we've had with it. Uh, there might be some. One of the issues that I know of is, um, again, working with translations. When you want to, let's say, add a new paragraph on um, a language version, and you want that to be unpublished for now, uh, you cannot really translate that on the other page until you publish the original node. Uh, that's how paragraphs work, unfortunately. Um, that's one of the things that we found out. Um, in regards to other revisions, um, there were generally issues that we experienced. We kind of fixed them through because it was a, such a long continuous development process. Um, I wouldn't be able to pick point um, the issues that we've experienced over time right now. And uh, one more question. Um, any other limitations of paragraphs that you encountered and how did you work around those or uh, I guess decide to, to move forward? 
um, by limitations? Do you have any specific ideas in mind? Like uh, well, we, we talked about uh, revisioning, we talked about mm -hmm. uh, translations, um, we talked about like layout. I'm just wondering if anything c comes to mind uh, as far as other issues that uh, maybe you considered using something other than paragraphs for um, in this case or, or something like that. Mm, I don't have any exact situation right now uh, because generally uh, we try to uh, find flexible approaches in regards to how we build them out or how we treat them. Um, I think the only um, situation when we couldn't do a paragraph, even though like in Drupal 7 we were doing something with it, was maybe the search page, because we couldn't really get the search thing to be inserted as a paragraph. So it had to be like an own page with some functionality. Um, maybe that has changed, I don't know. Uh, but that's the only thing that I would say isn't uh, implemented like that. Um, other than that, I wouldn't be able to say something. Probably if we'll have other maybe designs, maybe business cases, maybe other things. Um, maybe we'll have situations like that. But so far, we, we worked around um, everything that we needed. All right. Other questions, comments, concerns, jokes, poems? <laughs> there we go. Hi, um, I work on a D7 site and we have paragraphs enabled. Mm -hmm. We use it sparingly though because we're really afraid of the technical debt we might be incurring in a data migration issue to Drupal 8. Is that, um, are there, is there like good tooling for that that I'm unaware of or is, is that really as bad as I think it is? I believe the answer is yes. Just just in case. Yes to both. Yeah, I think it will be challenging. Yeah. Especially um, if you'll go through a redesign process and then you'll need to rethink how everything is structured. Right. Probably. If you keep things exactly the same, maybe it would be a little bit easier. But at the same time, this is a bit uh, more technical. Um, then I am ready to answer today. <laughs> uh, I've heard of someone use a pretty odd technique to do this, though, which is, I, I forget the name, but if you Google it, it's there. There's a module that will uh, save your, your the output of your actual pages of flat HTML to flat HTML boost. That's boost. See, it would have and, to be, And if right? you, you save it as flat HTML with boost, yeah. and then you use the migrate tools module that we were talking about before, you can actually Kind of right. get your data out that way. I mean, that's an answer, but that's not that, the one I want. No, <laughs> that's fair. Yeah, I was wondering, you mentioned something earlier or towards the end of your talk about um, the interface. Uh, what kind of issues did you have with that? And is there difficulties, especially around nested paragraphs? Um, yeah, so I don't think there's a way to get around the nesting paragraphs because they are part of how the content is built. Um, but there is a module that we uh, found which basically instead of having this button that then, you know, when you click on add paragraphs has a very long list of paragraphs. Um, there is a module that allows you to see the paragraphs in a pop-up and then you have the screenshots for all of them. Uh, and you can have a better visual interface for oh, this is called a text block with image. How exactly does that look? Um, so you can grab a screenshot, you can upload it, and then editors will get to see that in the interface. And uh, with that module, you can also group um, the paragraphs in specific, uh, let's say, uh, types of paragraphs. So if you have, um, I don't know, paragraphs that deal with news or paragraphs that deal with other elements on the website, you can group them in, um, user-friendly buckets so that people would understand uh, what exactly they're working with. If you need the name of that, I can look it up and share it. Yeah, I can take a look. Anyone else? No one wants? Your wife? Sold. All right, thank you very much, Adriana. Thank you as well. <laughs> All right. All right, there we go. Uh, the next meetup right now, as I mentioned before, the next meetup is plain old tentative. We do not have this space in May. 
We do not yet have a space. If you have a space, we would like to talk to you. Um, if you have a suggestion, we would like to talk to you. Um, we're working on it, but we don't currently have a solution. So stay tuned before you uh, register for next month's uh, meetup. Make sure you're following us on Twitter. We always tweet them um, uh, uh, when, the, when we have info like that. Um, make sure you're on Slack, and we'll, we'll let everybody know as soon as we know when and where it will be. Um, but yeah. But June, we have this space again, and we're, we're back in business. We just, May is, is upfronts, and I got uh, overruled by people who make a lot more money than I do, and so this room went to bed. Okay. Uh, call for speakers. As always, we always want to hear about your ideas for speaking, um, for giving uh, uh, talks. This is a great one that we had today. Um, uh, if you have an idea, please don't forget, come talk to us. Um, and come on Slack, talk to the organizers. Great way to, uh, to get involved. After party, remember it's not at Bill's Bar, it's at Johnny Utah's today, 51st Street, 16 West 51st Street, uh, two blocks away if you go out the front of the building where the Christmas tree usually is. You may, oh, you may not be able to follow the path that is in this diagram due to the, um, uh, the Game of Thrones event going on. So you may have to, you may wanna go to 6th Avenue and then come back down on 51st Street. Um, so, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Lucy Arungu. Oh, Lucy, when you go to, if you go to the after party at Johnny Utah, say thank you to Lucy, because she's, she's hooking us up with a little bit of, you know, good stuff at Johnny Utah's. I don't know. That's it, go home. Leave. Get out. Okay, thank you, everybody. Forty-five. Eight oh three. Good job. Well done. We need to talk about something real quick, which is.